All right, family. Well, Shabbat Shalom again. We're excited. My prayer for you, though, is that uh, you are not full and filled up <laughs> with the first course and that you've saved uh, some room for the second course uh, 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 meal, um, if you will get an opportunity to see how inexhaustible Yah's word is. Um, and we want to do that today. Um, so I hope you have your Bibles because we're going to be flipping around and looking at some passages and uh, just see what Yah is ultimately saying to us on this day of Yom to Praise Yah. Trumpets. Yom Teruah. <clears throat> and we, we went into what that means, you know, day of shouting. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But, you know, with this on the forefront of our mind, what does it mean, you know? So we want to look at some things in regards to this day. Um, in regards to gathering, in regards to preparing, in regards to sacrifice, and in regards to warning. Now, we want to make sure that we clearly see these things in Scripture um, so that all these things are made clear to us for what we are to do on this day. So this idea <clears throat> of trumpet blasts or um, the occasions to blow the shofar in scripture and even to shout um, was done for several different reasons. You know, we can look throughout scripture and we can see all of those reasons. Um, and we'll go through a few. Um, one was to mark the arrival of the new moon. Um, one was to celebrate in a joyous occasion, um, to proclaim liberty to uh, the captives. Uh, to hail the king and his coronation. You know, you see it in, you know, movies and cartoons. You see the do 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 as the procession, the royal procession comes out. This is what trumpet blasts were for. Uh, they uh, were also for warning, you know, of impending judgment. Um, it was a trumpet blast to uh, gather the troops um, to battle. Right, we see that clearly, we'll look at that as well. Um, to sound the alarm uh, was, was another uh, purpose and reason. Uh, to call a sacred assembly, a time for fasting. And even to confuse the enemy, trumpet blasts will be blown to confuse the enemy or the enemy camp. Um, but one of the most important reasons, and we're gonna look at this again today, was to draw Yahuwah's attention to something. Um, we also know that trumpet is also likened to an inner calling, an inner warning. Um, and we see that if you can turn to Jeremiah uh, chapter four, uh, verse 19, it says this, it says, oh, my soul, my soul, I am pained in my very heart. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because you have heard, O oh my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Jeremiah speaking of the inner warning that was in him, in his heart, liking it to a trumpet. But as we looked at this morning, um, Brother Jadiel broke down um, specifically terua, meaning shouting. Um, and we see that, you know, we see that voice and trump was used synonymously um, in Isaiah chapter 58, verse one. Um, it says this, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people, their transgressions in the house of Jacob, their sins. Isaiah the prophet uh, speaking um, here and giving an exhortation uh, to the people, calling them to understand what the father wanted from them or desired from them 
in regards to true fasting, right? Um, but this is not a new idea. This idea of trumpets and warnings and gatherings is not something new. All these things began in Torah, and, and this is what was understood by Isaiah's audience. This is always what's understood by the prophets and to their audience when they're speaking of things. They're speaking of something that they should have known. There's something already understood about what the prophet is saying, and it is directly connected to the word of Yah, the, the, the Torah, right? Um, so in Leviticus, um, we, 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 we get introduced to this idea of gathering and what that means. Um, it says this in Isaiah chapter, I'm sorry, Leviticus chapter 23, um, starting in verse 23. It says, then Yahuwah spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying in the seventh month. And we clearly saw that in the first presentation what the seventh month was on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it and you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahuwah. So clearly we see here, there is a calling to gather, but there is also a focus on the coming day because we know that it then goes to talk about in, in Leviticus, the 10th day, which is the day of atonement. So let's look at this a little bit further to, to kind of understand if you can turn to Numbers um, chapter 10, we'll look at this and try to understand what Yahuwah is saying to us. Numbers chapter 10, and we kind of covered this uh, last Shabbat when we started looking at these two trumpets that were made specific to a call for a gathering. It says this in verse one, it says, and Yahuwah spoke to Moses saying, make two silver trumpets for you, for yourself, you shall make them of hammered work. You shall use them for calling the congregation and for directing the movement of the camps. When they blow, both of them, all the congregation shall gather before you at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. But if they blow only one, then the leaders, the heads of the divisions of Israel shall gather you. When you sound the advance, the camps that lie on the east side shall then begin their journey. When you sound the advance the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall begin their journey. They shall sound the call for them to begin their journeys. And when the assembly is to be gathered together, you shall blow, but not the sound the vet, but not sound the advance. Then the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall blow the trumpets, and these shall be to you as an ordinance forever throughout your generations. So this call to gather, this trumpet blast to gather is something we need to pay attention to. And it goes into what I was talking about earlier, was that there was something already understood when the prophet spoke, um, that this was a gathering alarm. This was something that would bring you together. So I want that idea to get into our heads because the blast to gather is very important as we try to understand what all this means. Um, numbers, stay in numbers, go to chapter 29 and we'll read a couple more verses. Um, and, and I'm doing this just to frame our conversation. Um, numbers 29, um, it says this in verse one, I'll read the first six, six verses. It says, and in the seventh month, there it is again, on the first day, there it is again, of the month, you shall have a holy congregation. You shall do no customary work. For you, it is a day of blowing trumpets. Verse two, you shall offer a burnt offering as a sweet aroma to Yahuwah one young bull, one ram, and seven lambs in their first year without blemish. Pay attention. Their grain offering shall be fine flour mixed with oil, three-tenths of an ephah. For the bull, 
two tenths for the ram, one tenth for each of the seven lambs, also one kid of the goats as a sin offering to make atonement for you. Besides the burnt offering with its grain offering for the new moon, the regular burnt offering with its grain offering and their drink offerings according to the ordinance as a sweet aroma and offering made by fire to Yahuwah. So we see clearly that we have an instruction not just to gather, um, but to sacrifice after we gather. So this whole idea, you know, was kind of talked about earlier. Uh, you know, what do we do uh, when we come together? Do we make these sacrifices? Okay, well, here's the instruction. Do we follow this? What is it that we're supposed to do now? What does this, you know, message, this passage mean to us? What are we supposed to do? So I, I, I want to kind of look at that and, and, and frame what exactly we are to do. Um, and we, we got introduced to this, this idea of sacrifice and what we are to do. But I want to give an understanding so that we can see it spelled out right before us in Hebrews chapter 10. Um, we see the, the, the Hebrew writer writing and explaining sacrifice. Um, and I believe this ushers us in to where we ought to be. Um, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, starting in verse one, it says this, it says, for the law, the Torah, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of things, can never with the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect, right? So these uh, sacrifices that, that, that they were told to do could never continually make those who approach perfect. So there's something about these sacrifices that wasn't long lasting. For then, uh, verse two, would they have ceased to be offered? In other words, there would be no need for more, more, more offerings if they were perfect after these offerings. For the worshipers, once purified, would have no more consciousness of sins. Verse three, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it, is, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came to the world, he said, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Verse seven, then I said, behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me, Yahushua, right? <clears throat> to do your will, O Elohim. Previously saying, sacrifice and burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to Torah, to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. O Elohim, he takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will, we have seen or we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Yahushua Messiah once and for all. So then this shadow of the offerings that were presented um, to the Israelites were a shadow of what was to come of the coming Messiah. And they understood that, you know, we, we, we talked about that uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the woman at the well. When Yahushua started having a conversation with her, she told him of their Samarit Samaritan um, understanding was that there was a Messiah coming. He then tells her, I am that Messiah. So they knew, they knew that there was a coming Messiah. This is the understanding that he now becomes that sacrifice. So. We're instructed to do these, these sacrifices, but we're not doing the sacrifices of the Tanakh, right? According to what we just read in Hebrews chapter 10. So what are we supposed to do, right? So Sister Lisa 
you know, brought this out in the first portion, she said, Romans 12, one and two, she said this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of Elohim, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to Elohim, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of Elohim, right? So there's this, there's this understanding that we are to do something, um, not only with our bodies, but with our understanding, right? How do we do that? How do we, how does this happen? Romans 6 uh, verses one through four says this, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not, Yah forbid. Let that thought perish from your thinking. How shall we who died in sin live any longer therein? it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Yahushua, Messiah were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Messiah was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So we are to reckon the old man dead, it says. Right? So so there's this, this whole idea of that, that we're supposed to reflect on something. We're supposed to sacrifice something. We're supposed to even change something. Right? What does that look like? It says, reckon the old man dead. As the old man died in baptism, coming up out of the water, you are a new man. So the old man looks like this, Galatians 5 tells us. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts, wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murderers or murders, drunkenness, rivalries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in past time or time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of Elohim. What does that mean? That means that we are to make sure that when we're examining ourselves, we're making sure that these things are not prevalent. When we're self-reflecting, we're making sure that these things don't stand as a way of life, that these aren't our habits, that these aren't recognizable in us by doing what? When we reflect, do we look like this? Is this what we look like, right? We're supposed to be the new man. So we're talking about sacrifice. We're talking about reflecting. The measuring stick for what we're reflecting. Those old things are going away. These new things, but the fruit, verse 22, of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. And those who are messiahs have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. If we live in the spirit, the Ruach, let us also walk in the spirit, in the Ruach. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So there is a gathering from the shout, from the blast. There is self-reflection for us to measure ourselves against the things that are no longer supposed to be there to measure ourselves beside the things that are supposed to be there, repent of those things, then we are purified, then we are prepared for the coming 10th day, that coming day of, your, your, uh, uh, of atonement. Um, and we talked about the warning, you know, Yahushua uh, warning us. Um, we also saw the warning of Noah, right? 
I'm not going to go there, but we know that for several, several, several days, even years, Noah warned. Um, all those that got on the ark were saved, those that were not perished, right? There's a warning always before the judgment. What does Yahushua say about this? In Matthew chapter 24, um, and I want to pay close attention to this because there's something I want us to see. The disciples were asking, you know, when is the end? You know, wh wh what are the signs of the end? How will we know when the end is coming? You know, very, very important that this morning, you know, uh, the seventh month was broken down because it gives us an understanding of the time, right? That the reasons for the pointing of the Moedim, these three Moedim, were because there's an emphasis on the time. The timing is the most important thing here, right? Look, look at what he says in Matthew chapter 24. I'll start in verse 29. He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great, great glory. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect, the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So we see a darkness new moon. We see a light, that sliver looking for that first day, and the trumpet blast that comes calling us to gather. I hope you guys saw that clearly. Knowing the time to be prepared to stand before him. We have to know the time, right? It's important that we understand these are specific times. You know, First Thessalonians speaks of, of, of the king in the gathering. Paul explains it not just in the gathering, but comforting them in Messiah's return, because they wanted to know when he was going to return. First Thessalonians chapter 4, it says this in verses 15 and 16, it says, for this we say to you by the word of the master, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the master will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the master himself will ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of Elohim. And the dead in Messiah will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the master in the air. And thus we shall always be with the master. Therefore comfort one another with these words, right? so. We see this whole idea of trumpets and blasts and ending and judgment and gathering and preparing and turning away from sin, repenting to be prepared to receive the judgment to be seen as pure gold right before the master. But one of the things that, that I wanted to look at, remember when I was running down all of the reasons why the trumpet is blown? And I said, we're going to come back to this one particular one, and this was to draw Yahuwah's attention, right? So there's something I want us to see. Um, this morning, um, we, start, we looked at Joshua chapter six. I wanna look at that again. I wanna look at some specific verses, and I want us to see what Yahuwah is saying to us here. Um, so I'm gonna read first um, Joshua chapter six. I'm gonna read verses one through five. I'm going to read verse 10, I'm going to read verse 16, and then I'm going to read verse 20. So we all we know that um, teruah means to shout, right? A great shout. Um, so let's see what, what, what Yahuwah is telling us here in Joshua. Uh, uh, chapter 6, verse 1 says, Now Jericho was securely shut up because the children of Israel because of the children of Israel. None went out 
and none came in. And Yahuwah said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war, you shall go around the city once. You shall do six days, oh, excuse me, this you shall do six days. And the seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of the ram's horn before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times and the priest shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn and when you hear the sound of the trumpet that all the people shall shout with a great shout, then, all, then the wall of the city shall fall down flat and the people shall go up every man straight before him. So it says the people shall ruah, right? With a great teruah. So there's something here that's happening. Let's continue to look and see what's happening here. There's an organization to what he's saying. He said there will first be a long blast and then there'll be a shout with a great shout, right? Verse 10, now Joshua had commanded the people saying, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout, then you shall shout. So there's an instruction on exactly when to shout. Right, so everything is contingent upon the time, the season, the moment, and the direction to only do this when I tell you to do it, right? Very important, we understand this here. Verse, um, uh, or continue, it says, and the seventh time it happened when the priests blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, shout for Yahuwah has given you the city. That's verse 16. So he so so he tells him to shout. Yahuwah tells him to shout. Joshua tells him to shout. Verse 20 says this. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets, and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down flat. Then the people came, uh, went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. So we see clearly that the trumpets were a signal for the people to shout. So the trumpet blows and the people shout. That's when the walls fell. Yahuwah's movement hinges on the shout of his people. It is his people that he wants to hear. Verse, uh, when we read Numbers 29, this is a teruah, a shout unto Yahuwah, right? So it, the people's shout hinged on what Yahuwah was going to do. It wasn't a trumpet, but it was the shout of the people. So we see that first the trumpet, then the shout, then Yahuwah moves, which means the people have to be in unison, that people have to be in one accord. Yahushua is not going to hear unless the people shout together. Praise God. So I want to end this um, message by looking into the full picture, not just of, of Yom Teruah, but of the entire fall feast time, right? because I think this passage is gonna really spell it out for us. Um, and I'll read and explain. <clears throat> so in Nehemiah chapter eight, we know this is when Ezra came before the people, the rebuilding of the temple and the people wanted to worship. Matter of fact, the people asked to hear the word. It says this, in chapter eight, verse one, when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were 
in their cities. Now all the people gathered together as one man, as one together in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which Yahuwah had commanded Israel, verse two. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month, all right? So this is Yom Teruah. Verse three, then he read it from the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday. Before the men and women, those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law, right? So the people asked to hear. Um, let's, let's see what Ezra did. Verse four, so Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood which they made for the purpose <clears throat> and beside him, listen closely, at his right hand stood Mat Matathia, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, Messiah, and at his left hand, Padiah, Mishael, Malchiah, Hashem, Ashpadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up, and Ezra blessed Yahuwah, the great Elohim. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen. While lifting up their hands, they bowed their heads and worshiped Yahuwah with their faces to the ground. This is a perfect picture of self-reflection and repentance and calling on the name of Yahuwah, right? But there's something here that I want you guys to see, and this will kind of tie everything in. You know how we make sure that we always try to understand, you know, as a family, as we're reading through scripture, you know, what these names mean, because these names mean something. We've done it. We've done it in Genesis. We've done it in Numbers. We've done it in Exodus. We did, you know, we've done it <clears throat> um, throughout our studies, um, just so we can understand the full picture of what Yahuwah is saying. So let's let's do that. Let's 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 do that. Let's take these names and see if they can tell us something. Um, on the right hand, Matathia means gift of Yahuwah. Shema means to hear. We know that, right? Shema O Israel, hear O Israel. It also means sound or hearken, right? Anaya means Yahuwah answered or Yahuwah responded. <clears throat> Uriah means the flame or the brilliance of Yahuwah. The root word of, of uh, Uriah is Yerim. Remember Yerim and the Thurim um, in the building of the breastplate in Exodus 28, showing the brilliance of the breastplate. So the flame or brilliance of Yahuwah. Hilka means the portion of Yahuwah. <laughs> And in Deuteronomy 32, um, verses eight and nine, it says the portion of Yahuwah is Israel. It says this in Deuteronomy 32, eight and nine, it says, when the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. For Yahuwah's portion is his people. Jacob is a place of his inheritance. So we, we see Hilkah, the portion of Yahuwah, which is Israel, right? Uh, Messiah means the work of Yahuwah. Now, on his left hand, we had other names. Padiah, which means the redeemed or the delivered or the ransomed of Yahuwah. Mishael is actually a question, 
which asks, who is Elohim? Uh, Malkiah or Micaiah, Malkiah means Yahuwah reigns or my king is Yah. Uh, Hesham means to be enriched or to be wealthy. <clears throat> Hashpadana means to plot out judgment. Zechariah means remembered by Yahuwah. And Meshulam or Meshulam means to be safe or to be complete, right? So when we put these names together, um, they tell the story of the fall feast, the last three Moedim, uh, um, Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. <clears throat> so this is what it says. On his right hand stood the gift of Yahuwah to hear our shout. Yahuwah answered his brilliance, his people, his work. On his left hand stood the redeemed. The question is asked, who is Elohim? The redeemed answered, Yahuwah reigns and is enriched to plot out judgment. And those remembered by Yahuwah are safe. This is what was spelled out in Joel chapter two from this morning's message. This is the meaning of these Moedim right here, right in front of us in Nehemiah chapter eight. Praise Yah by the names. And one of the takeaways I got from this is that, you know, the need for repentance, you know, can easily be ignored if you don't read or apply Torah. <clears throat> because when you read it, it's impossible not to see the consistency. It's impossible not to see the consistency um, and the pattern and the changing thoughts and actions because it calls you to repentance. That's exactly what it is. Turn to Torah. Oh, you say, this is what Yahuwah wants me to do. This is how he wants me to live. This is how he wants me to speak. This is how he wants me to eat. This is how he wants me to dress. This is how he wants me to worship. This is what he wants me to remember. So um, I pray that, you know, this study really illuminated, you know, some of the things that we look at and sometimes we read over as we try to understand just what these days, these Moedims are about. And uh, all praise to, to the Most High for, for what he's done. Uh, praise Yah. Shabbat Shalom. Hallelujah, brother. That brought some clarity and some understanding that I've not seen before. So thank you for sharing that. But those names and the message that came out of that, that's powerful. As we see co continually, as we look at the names and see the meanings, the story that's behind that is so much more enlightening and deeper, you know. So I've learned a lot today just from the, the two messages. It's brought even more clarity to me. So thank you all for being obedient. Praise God, absolutely. <clears throat> Feel free to raise your hand if you have a comment when I add anything. Uh, Brother Paul. Shabbat Shalom. Uh, I just wanted to know what chapter you were in when um, you had the list. It, it was talking about um, there was adultery and hatred and, and things like that on a, on a list. Um, that was Galatians 6. So in, in, in understanding you know, us, our sacrifice. You know, we sacrifice our bodies <clears throat> to him. You know, that becomes what he ultimately wants because he always wanted the heart <laughs> from the beginning. Um, you know, the sacrifices that they did offer, the grain, the meat, you know, the, the, the bulls and goats, that was a temporary thing. And that was a shadow of what he truly wanted. Um, so when we look at, okay, this self-reflection, what is this self-reflection about? What are we, what, what is the barometer for what this self-reflection is about? We have to have them, right? And that, that, that barometer is what he's given us in scripture as the way we ought to live and be. 
which is the fruit of the Ruach. Um, and those things that the dead man um, um, lived by are to no longer be a part of our character. So, uh, praise God. Asia. All right, Brother JP. No, I just wanted to ask. Um, let me probably go outside. Yeah. <clears throat> I was wondering about the the whole reading of the of the Torah that day. Uh, what is your thoughts? I mean, as in, is that was that just a practice of that time for that time point because of there's you know, the way that the history in history that where they're at, or is this something that um, maybe should be practiced today? Uh, you know, cause I, it was, that was a long reading. <laughs> he said from morning to evening. So I was like, Whoa, like, was well, that, or was it just to well, emphasize, you know what I mean? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so from morning, morning to midday, uh, which we started in the morning, it's now midday, right? <laughs> so we're actually doing that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think in regards to kind of understanding what was going on is that, you know, the, the temple was being rebuilt. They were coming out of captivity. They were returning back to what they hadn't been doing all those years while they were in Babylonian captivity. So this was a returning. This was a repenting. When the people realized what they were supposed to be doing by the reading of the word, they immediately repented. They were immediately worshipped. Um, so yeah, we, sh we should be you know, on these days, we should be in the word, uh, being reminded of not only what did happen, but what will happen and what we're doing right now. So <clears throat> scripture is repetitious in that way. It's constant reminder, it's constant memorials um, and everything, <coughs> excuse me, is repeated over and over um, in its consistency. Um, uh, Jim. Shalom. Great message. <laughs> oh, thank you. I actually hadn't heard it. Um, so it was great hearing, hearing, uh, the word. I had two quick comments. The first, when you were listing out the, the fruit of the Ruach, I was reminded of a contrast to that that Sister Letty brought out one time in, in a woman's study, and that is the the six things that Yahuwah hates, seven that he detests, that's in um, Pro Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, um, and ha haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies <clears throat> and a person who stirs a conflict in the community. And so those, those things are, um, you know, opposite of, uh, you know, the, you know, the fruit, the fruit that, that you listed in Galatian um, and Galatians, you know, when it talks about Shalom and, um, gentleness, goodness, kindness, you know, the, those kinds of things. And the, the second comment, uh, when you were speaking about the people marching around, um, was it Jericho? The Jericho mm -hmm. march? Oh, when they were marching around Jericho and you were saying, you know, they had to follow the instructions specifically and at the right time shout with their voice and that it was literally their voice. And cause we, someone had brought out yesterday that it, you know, sounding, we sound the show, shofars, but we can also make that loud sound with our voices too. And it just reminded me of Ephesians six on the battlefield, you know, um, I'm not suggesting that we shout at the enemy, but just with our voice, you know, proclaiming the word, that's our offensive weapon. Again, you know, the sword of the Ruach and the word. And because uh, they were on the battlefield physically shouting out, which brought down the walls, but us spiritually on that spiritual battlefield in today, uh, you know, we, we can remember to 
when the father instructs us with the timely word to slice and dice <laughs> the enemy, you know, and submit to Yahuwah, resist him and he must flee. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. <clears throat> yeah, and it also speaks to, you know, as far as instruction and what we are to understand, you know, the 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 voice, the the, the ruah, the teruah, the shout with the great shout. Um, and and the fact that Yahuwah didn't move until they shouted, you know, brings to the forefront of our minds that the, the trumpet sound, the blast sound, is what calls us to the warning that we are supposed to gather then to shout, and that's when he returns. You know, so, you know, it's the voice of his people, as, as was covered also this morning, that he is looking to hear in unison. You know, um, all on one time frame, you know, you know, we have several different, you know, calendars in operation right now, but eventually we all have to be on one, the right one. So in order for us to come together and shout in unison, it says in, in Nehemiah, they came together as one man, you know, that's, that's prominent to what he wants from us, you know, so we have to pay attention to these things. As we as we continue to look and understand scripture as well. Praise you. Brother Charles. Yeah, I went to sleep listening, looking at um all the ancient artifacts and Ephesians and Galatians. And um for some reason I woke up and the guy was saying, I can't remember what chapter it said, um, you do this like it's a job. You don't do it because you love them. And that's all I heard. And I was, I just want to share that. I don't know what part of the verse that is. The, the, what guy? It was a guy that I was looking at. It was something on YouTube I was looking at. And I woke up out of my sleep and it said, um, you do this not because you do this like it's just a job, like it's a prop, you know, just wake up doing this, but not because you love me. And I was, I just wanted to share that because I think that was a message to me. Because I'm, I'm, I'm believing I was doing it all for the wrong reason, just not to go to hell, but not because I really love him. I'm not <clears throat> following. That's why I'm maybe, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, no, our, our perspective, you know, most definitely has to be right. Most definitely has to be correct when we look at, um, you know, all of Tor, all of his instructions, like, you know, looking at it like it's his his grace and his mercy that he gives us this opportunity to be saved. The living according to the way he instructs us to is a gift because it gives us life. You know, to not live that way is 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 to die. You know, so you know he says, I, I, I you know, you have life and death here. It says in in in, in the Torah, choose life. You know, so absolutely. You know, he wants us to to love him um, and not do anything begrudgingly, <clears throat> not even give begrudgingly. So praise God. Praise God. Anybody else? All right. Well, this concludes our second portion study. We can. I'll close it here, but we can stay on and continue to have conversation. Praise Yah. Happy Yom Teruah. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom. We pray this video is helpful to your journey in the truth. Remember to be like the Bereans in Acts 17 11, who received the word with all readiness of mind, then search the scriptures to see if what they heard was true. We have studies for the whole family, including children, every week. To learn more, visit assemblyofyahuwah.com. Use the Join tab to express interest in participating. Use the Give tab to help support biblical assembly needs. To be notified of new videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Trust in Yahuwah with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and he will direct your path. Much love and shalom.